Welcome to the hidden corners where truth and terror collide. Discover a realm where the lines between the living and the supernatural blur as you embark on a journey to the paranormal and visit the mysterious hidden corners of your mind. Horror in the Mortuary Adapted from a story by Herbert Hipwell Peter Stubbs has snow white hair and he is only 28. He mutters to himself as he pursues his lowly task of sweeping the streets in our little university town. His eyes dart to and fro as if expecting to see something or someone coming at him. Peter once had raven black hair and was as strong a young fellow as ever led the town bullies in their frequent battles with our students. That was before the one night he spent as caretaker of our medical school mortuary. Only two of us know the real story of that night and why Peter was taken from the building the next morning, a gibbering and white-haired idiot. We have remained silent for various and selfish reasons, but I can no longer keep to myself the story of that awful night. Our medical college is a lonely, ramshackle old building. The town has grown away from it. It is surrounded by musty old junkyards and infrequently used railway sidings, and it is miles from the fine old group of buildings which form the rest of the university. There has always been difficulty in getting a suitable caretaker for it. None of the many who have been employed by the university could be relied on to come early enough to get the fires going properly and to keep the walks clear of snow. Our new dean, Dr. Towney, thought he had solved the problem by deciding to have a caretaker live permanently on the premises. Peter Stubbs, on learning of this, applied for the post and had no difficulty in obtaining it. The dean showed him around the building and explained the duties required of him. A more imaginative man might have been a little chilled by the gaunt skeletons arranged in the cases of some of our classrooms. Certainly he would not have been pleased with the sleeping quarters picked out for him. The only room available was a small, closet-like room directly connected to the mortuary. In fact, you had to walk through the large room with the marble slabs to get to that little sleeping room. Frequently, bodies would be there overnight, awaiting the purposes of the college, to be used by medical students in the study of forensics and physiology. Most persons would not welcome these as nighttime neighbors, but Peter scoffed and said he would just as soon sleep there as in a brightly lit hotel. Eric Channing and I were in the nearby room working on a term project and overheard the conversation between the dean and Peter. Both Eric and I had old scores to pay with Peter. His steel fist had left a blue circle around my eye for a week now, and Eric was minus a tooth as a result of a hot encounter between Peter's followers and us freshmen. Eric jumped at my brilliant proposal for a little taste of revenge. Are you game for a little ghost walking? I whispered to him as Peter and the dean left for another part of the building. Eric asked for details. It's the chance of a lifetime if we have the nerve, I declared. Let's sneak back into the building tonight, crawl onto a couple of slabs in the mortuary, and cover ourselves with sheets. We'll look enough like corpses to fool Peter if he looks in. Then, when Peter goes to bed and it gets good and lonely, we can come to life with a few gentle moans, get Peter aroused, and then do a little ghost dance for his benefit. After we have frightened him stiff, we can take off the sheets and give him the laugh. The story will get around quick enough, and poor old Peter won't be troubling us freshmen anymore. Eric could scent trouble in the wild scheme, and he hastily began to offer objections. Peter knows there aren't any bodies in there now, Eric said. 
That's all right, I replied. In fact, I know there will be one there for certain. One of the inmates at the prison died today. I read that he was so mean and wild that they had to keep him locked up tight all the time. He had no family, so the body is coming here. Eric was still unconvinced, but had no plausible excuses. I felt my eye, which was still sore from Peter's bruising, and started to work out the details to my plan. I was right about the body. The undertaker's car drew up to the college just as we were leaving. We were the last students to go, and the dean was the only other person there. He asked our aid in bringing the massive body to the mortuary, and we helped roll the gurney into the building and left it there next to the cold marble slabs. Peter arrived from supper to begin his first night's stay, just as the dean and we were leaving. Later that evening, Eric and I met near the college about 10 o'clock, and we prepared to carry out our plan. My courage was beginning to wane. A sliver of a crescent moon was the only light around the dreary building, and every rustle of a leaf or disturbed pebble began to send shivers up my spine. But I couldn't turn back now. Silently, we pried open one of the loosely locked basement windows. Then we crept up the dark stairs and walked past the classrooms. The skeletons that hung in the classroom stood out like white patches in the murky darkness and added to the eerie adventure. We reached the mortuary room and groped our way in the darkness. I almost cried out as my hand suddenly came in contact with the dead man lying on the gurney, but I recovered myself. Eric groped in the corners until he found two immense white sheets. We climbed upon adjacent slabs and stretched out on our backs and pulled the coverings over us. I managed to keep a small corner raised so that I had a partial view of the room as my eyes grew accustomed to the darkness. The stillness grew intense. We heard the long, dreary hoot of a freight engine. I shivered involuntarily and thought of the real corpse a few feet away. Footsteps echoed in the building. Peter was making a round of inspection before retiring. He switched on the lights in the mortuary and gave a little gasp of surprise at the three still white figures lying there. He began to whistle a little tremulously in an attempt to take the edge off the quiet in the room and steady his nerves. Evidently, he was not feeling as bold as when he accepted his post. He quickly left and retired to his little room, shutting the door behind him, and all went still again. Our plan was to wait until we were sure Peter was asleep and then begin our moaning. I began to see the folly in our little plan. What if Peter didn't think it funny? What if he became enraged and pounded us with his iron fists? I had completely lost my nerve and was about to tell Eric that we should just abandon the plan and get the heck out of there when we heard a slight sound coming from the direction of the gurney. The sound turned me cold from head to foot. Horrified, I gazed through the small gap in my covering. I could not believe my eyes. The corpse of the maniac prisoner had moved. There came a faint rustle of his covering shroud, and the body moved again ever so slightly. I wanted to shriek in terror, but I was paralyzed. Eric, who could not see out of his sheet at all, whispered to me, What is it? What's going on? Shh! I whispered under my breath with urgency. The shroud moved again, this time more noticeably. My scalp tightened, and I could feel the goose flesh rising all over my body. Then, with one sudden motion, the enormous man sat bolt upright and threw the shroud from him. He was clothed only in a long hospital nightgown. His thin hair stood up in tangled wisps, and his eyes blazed like those of a cat in a dark room. Slowly he surveyed his surroundings, and then burst into the most hideous laughter I have ever heard. His big yellow teeth seemed like the fangs of a wild animal. 
I could imagine them rending my flesh. Apparently his death was only a ruse, either by himself or prison guards he had somehow paid off in order to fake his death. The echo of his hideous laugh had hardly died away when Peter burst from his room, wearing only his underwear. His knees almost gave way as he took in the dreadful scene. Horror was apparent in every line of his body, and I had an inexplicable desire to laugh. Quite calmly, the mad prisoner swung his legs down from the slab and sat there on its edge, transfixing poor Peter with his terrible gaze. He chuckled. Peter slowly backed toward his sleeping room. In an instant, the madman was at him. There commenced a wild chase around the room, of which I could only catch fleeting glimpses as they passed on one side of my slab, where my sheet was slightly opened. Eric and I were unable to make a move, both terrified beyond our wildest imagination. Untiringly, cunningly, the madman pursued his prey. Peter dodged and squirmed in terror. Perspiration poured from his face. Finally, he was penned in a corner. Step by step, the madman approached him his long fingers outstretched like talons, and a low, gleeful laugh came from his lips. Peter backed desperately away from him. The maniac's fingers were almost at his throat when suddenly Eric sat up from his marble slab, the sheet still covering him. The diversion caused the madman to turn his head toward us, and Peter managed to push past the madman to the big oak door, the only door in that large room that led out to the corridor. The door swung open, and Peter tumbled from the room, his body bumping and thudding on the stairs outside as the door slammed shut. Startled by the sudden disappearance of his victim and Eric's body sitting up on the marble slab, the madman, his eyes now wilder than ever, swept the room and saw the open window. As quick as a flash, he leaped through the window and was gone. As quickly as we could, we ran from the mortuary all the way home. A widespread manhunt was underway for the escaped prisoner. We told no one about our night in the mortuary, but poor Peter never recovered from his fright. The terror of seeing the dead come to life and chase him around the room had turned all his hair white, and he was unable to utter an intelligible word. As for the escaped prisoner, they never did find him. And even now, I sometimes wake at night in a cold sweat and feel for the butt of the revolver under my pillow.